Wild times. <laughs> that sounded so stupid. <laughs> it was great. All right, that'll do. That uh, We'll call that an intro to episode 19. Wild times. There was an abandoned vermin monkey, and his name was Chippy. And, well, we named him Chippy, but there was an abandoned... <laughs> <laughs> I like that his name was already uh, Chippy. He had been named Chippy. That's his... right. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Wild Times. You're joined today by myself, the broologist, Mr. Forrest Galante, our producer, Mr. Patrick DeLuca. How you doing, Pat? I'm doing fucking great, man. It's nice to not be getting attacked at the beginning of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the attacker himself, the accused, um, mm-hmm. the professor, Peter Fitzer. What's up, Pete? Ah, doing good today. Uh, no attacks. I'm, I'm happy. I only had to reach out a few times to get everybody together this week. It's early. I'm happy. Welcome, as Forrest said, to the Wild Times. <laughs> Nobody said welcome. He, you did. No you, F, F in the welcome. You, you did say welcome. You did. I did? Oh. Well, in that case, wealth come, everybody. <laughs> it's actually, it's, it's wolf come is what I'm saying. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Um, let me ask you guys this. You going to be popping popping a little claw during this uh, podcast? No. God, I want to. I really want to, but I can't. Too much work to do. Boo. Peter? Yeah. I mean, of course, I, I've been drinking since uh, last week, the podcast we did last week, which was Sunday. <laughs> I'm having a Modelo. I've taken six shots of Mezcal. I've dropped. You're a liar. I've Don't dropped lie. a few hits of acid. I'm ready to go. Wow, that's quite a call. You're lying to our listeners. That's a that's a lie. You called them listeners, and we were just talking about how we can't call them that anymore because apparently it's offensive. Well, I teed that up for Patrick to be like, "Hey, let's not call them listeners and tell his story." But you just boned it, Peter. So now we'll just have to go from scratch. Nah, I didn't bone it. I I made it better. Apparently, that's a thing, though, right? And I did realize. So a couple of our we can't call them listeners anymore. Apparently that's like a bad word. Uh, have said like, you know, other podcasts, like you, you, they got a name, right? So it's like, uh, to be like the spit wads or like the whatever. And it's like the crew that listens. <laughs> so we have to think of a name for our, cause we don't think of our listeners as just faceless listeners. We think of them as part of the, part of the experience, part of the crew. hundred mm-hmm. percent. And we know how you guys so, treat crew members. So, <laughs> Yeah, we're great. I was thinking, I was thinking, Wild Boys with a Z, but we have a lot of female listeners, so that doesn't work. So then I was thinking the Special. the what the Wild Bunch, Wild it's, Bunch. Ugh. This is terrible. What are you? <laughs> that's weird. Are you trying to make a title for a cable television show? This is yes, a, that's what his job is. <laughs> <laughs> How about like Come the, on. the the Broisners, the Broisners, the Brith Peter, listeners? That's, that's terrible. That's disgusting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, so right. so, what are you proposing? We'll think you... of it throughout the episode. I mean, I... Wild Bunch is pretty dumb. I don't like that. It's just ah, how about how about we do this? We let's put it out to the the wild the wild bunch. God, that they uh, <laughs> they should hit us up on social media or comment in the iTunes. What should the name of the crew be? Oh, that's a good call. And we'll pick the best one. Yeah. What would you, the listeners, which we can no longer call you apparently because somehow that's offensive. Um, like to be called when we <laughs> refer to people that listen to our podcast. Let us know. Uh, hit us up on social. Leave us a review on iTunes, and we'll pick the best one. And that'll be that'll be the name that uh, you all are appointed from here on out. So, what have you guys been up to this week? Any more fun, exciting uh, <laughs> adventures with your dog on your surfboard that goes way too fast, <laughs> white claw in hand, Forrest? No, it's. It's actually been a pretty mellow uh, week as far as adventures go for me because, you know, we got Shark Week coming up. Yeah. Uh, well, this week. And um, so I've been just wall to wall with doing press, a uh, whole bunch of different, you know, interviews, TMZ, good, uh, not Good Morning America. What, what else do we do? TMZ, Newsweek, uh, LA Times, all that kind of stuff. So it's been it's been pretty slammed. It's been keeping my schedule pretty busy uh, promoting the show and talking about that and it's so exciting because it's funny. All of these news outlets want to talk to me about the discoveries, but we can't talk about what we saw or what happened or what we accomplished until after it airs. So there's a <laughs> lot of like baiting going on where I can't exactly tell everybody the story, but uh, it's it's pretty fun. I'm, I'm excited for this one to come out for sure. Yeah, t- TMZ. You went back with TMZ even after they fucked you last time. I bet they were uh, they're master baiters, aren't they? They're masters they're, at baiting people. <laughs> they are very good at it. 
No, yeah, I look, I don't mind them. They don't fuck. They they steal sound bites and all of that, and they make it dramatic. But at the end of the day, they're pre- they're all pretty cool over there. And whatever they edit, they edit. I know what I said. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. What about you, Pat? Oh, uh, not too much, man. Just been, uh, you know, back in L.A. It's been a fucking rude awakening, boy. I'll tell, tell me, tell us about it. What 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 do you mean? I mean, just going from like months of like being outside all the time, surrounded by fucking squirrels and fishing and fucking paddle boarding and pine trees and waterfalls. Angry beavers. Yeah. And like just living in West Hollywood, man, it's just you're in a fucking cement box and like the excitement of the day is walking to Starbucks. Uh, oh, God. With <laughs> a mask brutal. on, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just grim, man. I'm like, fuck, I got to get... I, 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 I mean, Forrest and I have been talking about, you know, with a bunch of our crew guys that we work with, like, where do we go? Like, let's get out of Southern California. It's so expensive. Let's, let's, let's all move somewhere. That's yeah. got tons of cool nature shit to do. And, uh, I'm thinking if that doesn't happen, like in the next legit, like three months, I'm going to have to buy a cabin somewhere like, like yeah. soon, like real yeah, soon. Man. Pat's not even joking. Like him and I, and a couple of the guys we work with, we've been talking about all like collectively. Cause you know, you, most of you guys live in LA. One of our buddies lives in San Diego, Johnny, and then I'm up here in Santa Barbara. But Southern California is just so expensive and so difficult to do business in. Yeah. We were all talking about up and moving. We looked at Oregon. We've talked about North Carolina and like starting our production company, which makes, you know, Extinct or Alive and the Shark Weeks and everything like that, just somewhere, somewhere else where we'd all kind of live in the same area and have, have our company. It, it'd actually be a blast. Be great. But dude. Not to mention, dude, like if, if like four or five of us did that and obviously Retep, you have to, to come as well. Uh, we could just buy a boat, like, like yep. six people buying a boat to share makes yeah. way more sense than, you know, each buying a boat. Like, ugh, God, it'd be so great. We just have to get the balls to do it, man. Totally. And everyone's totally. got an excuse as to why, like everyone's got one thing as to why they can't do it. A lot of wives or girlfriends or fiancés that uh, yep. they can't move or don't want to. It's, it takes one person doing it. One of us has to just commit and then the others will follow. But everybody's waiting for that one person to take it's true. It's true. <laughs> I mean, Pat, you as the team leader, you, you got to be the one to make the plunge and everybody's just going to follow. No, I don't think so. I think people would follow up, be more likely. Because like, like if Forrest did it, you know he's going to go get into a bunch of cool shit and be sending us pictures of all the fun stuff he's <laughs> totally, doing. Totally, yeah. totally. And then people will do it. The boat thing is, uh, my buddy had a boat out here in California in, in Marina del Rey, which is like the biggest marina in the country or something or close to it. And he said it was just an utter nightmare owning it and having to actually maintain it and deal with all the people that come out to maintain it. I think another benefit of of splitting a boat between six people is it makes the workload just way less. Like you'll be more likely to keep it and use it and fucking upkeep with all that bullshit. Uh, so I have a boat, right? And I've had a boat here for years in the Santa Barbara Harbor. And actually of all places to have a boat, it's great. But having two or three boat partners would make life so much better. Like right. other people oh, yeah. to split the maintenance. Other, I, I'm gone, you know, same as Patrick. I'm gone like three, four months at a time sometimes. Yeah. If I had a boat partner who could take the boat and run it, it would mm-hmm. be better than it sitting there for three months not getting run. Well, also, I, I mean, you're into like the spear fishing and lobstering and all that stuff, but I, I think boating on lakes is way more fun than oceans for several reasons. One, it's the flatter. The, yeah, well, <laughs> the, the drinking, drinking, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's flatter. You don't have to deal with anyone getting seasick. Uh, you can jump off the boat at any time with no concern about a giant squid or a shark taking you to the bottom. <laughs> a giant squid. Uh, yeah. I like to swim with my eyes open. That's enjoyable in a lake. It's awful in the salt water. There's just <laughs> so true. many reasons, dude. That's this guy's never heard of goggles, but yeah. <laughs> nah, you don't look cool in goggles, bro. <laughs> you look cool. True. You look way cooler in a, in a lake boat, too. Uh, and not to mention, we'd obviously have a couple jet skis, which on a lake yeah. is just fantastic. Oh, it's a must. jet skis are impossible. The first time I ever rode a jet ski myself was on, on the ocean on said friend's boat. He brought, he brought the sea dew out on a string attached to the boat. Dude, I just went, I cranked this thing. I'm going like 30, 40, hit a swell, just boom, went flying like 30 feet. I don't even know how far away from the thing. Now you're in open sea. You're in an open ocean. Do you know how fucking scary that is? I, I thought I was going to get eaten by a shark immediately. I swam as <laughs> fast as I could back to this goddamn thing. And then it broke down. 
met an hour later. Dude, I was uh, I was jet skiing once. I did this little thing in Key West where you you start out on the bay side of Key West, which is glass. So you're allowed to just take it to the max and you just cruise. You're going 50. It's fucking beautiful, man. The water's clear. Then you go through the channel and come out into the Atlantic side. Mm. And it is just massive waves. (laughs) And and I was with an ex that Peter knew. She was terrible. And uh, (laughs) and, uh, this is a long time ago. And she starts complaining that I was driving it too bumpy. But we're in like four foot (laughs) shop. I know who you're so, talking like, about, by the way. Yeah. She's like, you're driving it too bumpy. I'm like, dude, like we're keeping up with the rest of the people and like it's four foot swell. She's like, can you make it less bumpy? So I just did a hard jackknife right turn and just <laughs> fucking threw her off the jet ski. It was and kept fantastic. going. Kept no, going. obviously not. I'm not, I mean, it wasn't an attempted murder. <laughs> threw her a fucking life vest. <laughs> She was obviously uh, wearing the stuff. life vest. It was, I, I think it was uh, Dane Cook who said, he's like, well, you know, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy a jet ski. And have you ever seen anyone frowning on a jet ski? <laughs> it's like, you know what? You're right. Like, it's, it's hard to have a bad time on a jet ski. A buddy yeah. of mine who's uh, along those lines, I just talked to him this morning, and his, uh, his wife's a, a huge, one of the biggest female directors in L.A. And she heavy? Heavy set or no, no, she's, she's <laughs> oh, like a big biggest, shot, like a big wig. He, he big, missed, he missed big, the joke. Big Peter. shot. She's, joke. she's, she's doing very well. <laughs> but so they just moved into a new house and they, they just lived in a normal small house in LA and they just moved into their new house a couple months ago. I talked to him this morning and he was mm-hmm. like, yeah, he's like, uh, you know, the whole thing about like money, not buying happiness. <laughs> he's like, we've been. Just in our pool and hot tub every night drinking three bottles of rosé between the two of us. He's like, this is the happiest I've ever been. (laughs) Yeah, who the fuck says that? Why didn't anybody say that? Like, they must have been just like poor and and unhappy. Like, they must have never had money, I guess, right? I mean, you can be happy either way is what I'm saying. You don't need money to be happy, but it sure as fuck helps. Yeah. Am I right? Or am I being... Yeah, well, you're right. No, you're you're right. Y- <laughs> yes. In, in general, taking private jets to your Oceanside Villa in Kauai <laughs> on a whim is is a good way to make yourself happy. And Yeah, that's that's where you're going to be taking the team to get us the fuck out of LA. I consider myself part of the, the, uh, the team now with the podcast. You are. Oh, a hundred percent. It's funny the like, you know, the flip side of the coin and, and Patrick's seen this firsthand in Madagascar, but like where I grew up in Zimbabwe, right. And again, like in Madagascar and certain other places, you, you meet these kids right in these villages. They've literally never seen a television screen. They've never owned a toy that isn't a stick or a rock. They live in a mud rondavel hut with thatch houses. And there is not a frown to be seen as far as the eye can see, mm. you know, and then you come over here to the States, you know, I coach youth rugby and stuff and you got these kids with fucking playstations and BMX bikes and yeah. you know designer sunglasses and skinny jeans and they're just sulky and miserable and like right. life sucks. And it, it's, you know, I think it's all in the, in the eye of the beholder and, and what you make of it. But it's interesting to see that. Don't get me wrong. Everybody wants to have money. Money's great. But <laughs> when you see. When you see how little some of these kids have in certain places around the world and how happy they are Mm -hmm. versus how much kids here in the U.S. have in some cases and how miserable they are, it's it's pretty bizarre. Well, so there was a a big, a huge uh, like sociological survey done in, I think, 1998 or 1999 that was a a massive census with like a, a huge questionnaire that people did with interviewers. It's considered like the master set of data of sociology. And, um, I I think it was like a hundred thousand people and it was like literally like 500 or a thousand questions. Right. And Mm -hmm. so you can, there's a computer program where you can access that data set and you can control for different sets of variables to try and figure out different things. Does marriage lead to more money? Does, you know, how does happiness, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. When you look at people's happiness and you control for every possible permutation of variables, there was only one thing that had a very large statistically significant impact on people being more happy. And it, was, it plays to what Forrest just said. It was your wealth in relation to the wealth of the people around you. So it wasn't, uh, are you mm-hmm. wealthy or are you not wealthy or are you middle class? 
It was how do you compare in what you have to the people that are around you in your neighborhood, in your town, the people that you're around. That's interesting. Well, dude, it's yeah. so in other words, in other words, it's better to be a big fish in a little pond than a little fish in a big pond for happiness. Yeah. Like it, it's, it sort of goes to that thing. I mean, we've talked about this on the podcast and Forrest and I are really interested in the topic of social media depression. Mm-hmm, um, we, mm-hmm. we, we pitched a, sh- a wonderful show about it that nobody bought, but we did a great job. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, depression is is really, really high among social media addicts. And even just anecdotally in our friend group and stuff, you know, people do admit that like when they look and see other people, these lives that people curate on their Instagram, they will feel a tinge of jealousy or a tinge of missing out. Sure. Of course. So I think it's it's real relatable. You know, if you if you're the poorest person in your neighborhood, you're going to be sad. But if you had that same amount of money and everyone lived the same way you did, you you might just be like, sweet. The world is so much bigger, you know, relevant to what you just said about that study. Now everything is connected. It's like worldwide. So you're looking at wealth inequality to like Saudi billionaires who are fighting, you know, flying. That's a good jet, point. You know, yeah, so it's, it's true. You know, it's true. Yeah, you you might have been really happy, and then you got Instagram, and you're like, wait, now those people are part of your peer circle. These people that you've never met, these models right. in Miami hanging exactly. out on boats. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, enough philosophy about happiness, right. Forrest. <laughs> Let's get into some wild, wild times. times bullshit. Here we go. What do we got? Yeah, well, we got some good stuff in the news this week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> Wait, you can't call by- them listeners or ladies and gentlemen. That's even worse, Forrest. Please just stop. Address- it's 2020. I don't know what to say without offending someone. <laughs> I literally offended. don't know what words to say. I know that you're upset right now, Peter, because I said <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, and I don't know how else to speak. All right. All right. What you got? What you got? <laughs> um, I was stoked. Um, this news actually came out a little while ago, but it was the first time I saw it, that um, a California condor was spotted in the Sequoia National Park for the first time in 50 years. Ooh. So, you know, that's awesome. First of all, California condor, largest bird in North America, huge animals. They're, they're from right here where, where I am in Santa Barbara. And in fact, it was Santa Barbara and the Los Angeles Zoo that brought them back. But they came next down to being very, very close to extinction. Um, and, you know, we thought we were going to lose this incredible giant predatory bird that lived here in California. And now that thanks to places like the Santa Barbara Zoo, they've been reintroduced to a couple different species. But the fact that one has ventured into Sequoia National Park for the first time in 50 years, I think is is absolutely awesome. And whether you at, attribute that success to, you know, the quiet of lockdown or just the long term success of the Endangered Species Act doesn't really make a difference because no matter what, it's it's undeniably fantastic news. You know, and what's great about that is in 1987 was the last time a free flying condor was taken into a breeding program. So, you know, now there are over 300 of them out in the wild spreading out into places like Sequoia National Park. Um, and next year, they're going to be introduced into Redwoods National Park. And hopefully we're we're right on the cusp of seeing their population and their range slowly restored to what they should have been before the species was nearly wiped out. Why did these birds almost go extinct? Because they're huge. They have like a nine foot wingspan, right? Like, I mean, they're, they're enormous. What did they, what do they eat? They, they eat a lot of stuff. Um, carrion meaning dead stuff. Uh, they also do, do, um, some hunting, but yeah, basically, um, in the early 20th century, there was a ton of poaching for them. There was lead poisoning going on, mm-hmm. um, which was not directly for them. It was for rodents and things like that. And it would go up the food chain and into the condors. And then there was a bunch of habitat destruction. So, it, you know, a conservation plan was put into place, uh, I think here in California first, but I have to check that in 1987. And the total population in 1987 was 27 birds. That's all that Damn. was left. There were down to 27 of them. Uh, now we're back to 300 and, you know, now they're out in the wild. So, yeah, they came very, very close to the edge. I remember when I was a kid, like I grew up in the Northeast, but the California condor was like a huge thing in the 80s. I think maybe because they were right on the brink of extinction and they're the largest uh, North American bird by wingspan. Mm-hmm. When you actually look at one, it's it's a giant vulture. It looks exactly like a turkey vulture. And it is, by the way. I mean, it is just that. It is a vulture. It it consumes carrion, you know, dead animal carcasses more than anything else. They mm. are they are cleaners up of the environment and they're a huge necessity for a place like this. I mean, when's the last time you guys drove up, you know, the 101 or the 5 and didn't see a dead deer on the side of the road or didn't see, 
you know, dead raccoons. And, and those things spread disease mm -hmm. and animals like turkey vultures and condors clean that disease up. So they're, they're very essential in the environment. Do they, uh, do they clean up the uh, mattresses and couches that are all along the 101 and other highways out here in California as well? <laughs> will they eat those? <laughs> They probably will, and that's probably why they declined to only being 27 of them. Dude, nine-foot wingspan is just incredible to me. That's seven and a half feet taller than Pat. That's Your, your math is laughable, sir. <laughs> one and, I'm one and a half feet tall. <laughs> Two and a half, sorry. Yeah, I was off. The, the funny thing is, like, you, if, you, if you made fun of me for something, like, I'm not short. I'm not, not a short, short man. Yeah, it's very weird. You I always make short jokes. He's like well above average height. Well, listen, <laughs> you you literally call me. You make it sound to the I can't say listeners or ladies and gentlemen anymore, but the people, <laughs> the the wild who, crew who are tuning in <laughs> to this podcast. Like I'm like I'm literally 400 pounds. So that's true. Speaking it is not it true. Like oh, you make it sound that no, way. no. It's true. It's true. You are to fat what Patrick is to short. Exactly. Patrick is like two inches above the, the average and you're maybe 10 pounds overweight. But to our <laughs> listeners, Patrick is three and a half feet tall. And Peter, you are immobile. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in exactly. a wheelchair for Christ's sake. Yeah. Well, Peter, speaking of rotund ma mammals. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> did you guys, did this come across your desks uh, this week? The story about... <laughs> <laughs> the story about the American hippo bill. Oh yeah, we were. Yeah, I did see about that. I I, I don't have really a desk, funny. so no. All right, so so I'm going to set it up, and then I want to go right to you, Forrest. Yep. And you pretend you're a congressman, okay? Okay. So, so you're you you guys are both congressmen, okay? Yep. Or congress sense. congresswomen. It's 1910, by the way. Yeah. So it's 1910. Teddy Teddy Roosevelt, president outdoorsman, started the national forest system, mm -hmm. introduced and pitched to Congress something called the American Hippo Bill, which he wanted to introduce African hippos into the swamplands of Louisiana. The idea was, obviously, Teddy Roosevelt just thought hippos were cool, and he probably wanted to hunt them, but uh, <laughs> there was an invasive plant called the water hyacinth, and there was also, at this time, a meat crisis going on in the U.S. We, there, the meat supply chain was fucked up. So he thought, hey, we'll call it swamp bacon. Uh, we'll sell it for cheap. They'll eat this invasive plant, and there will be cool hippos all over the U.S. What do you say, Congress people? Yes or no? Well, yes, Mr. Roosevelt. When I'm done polishing my monocle, I think that this is a tremendous idea. <laughs> okay. That's one vote for yes. Swamp bacon, guys. Swamp bacon. You can get it at Ralph's. It's yeah, 49 no. cents a pound. <laughs> By the way, hippos are literally the most dangerous uh, four-legged animal on Earth, right? They are they are terrifying. Could you imagine if every time you wanted to go airboating in Louisiana, there were pods of hippo trying to flip you over and chomp you in two? And, and, and from what you've explained in several previous podcasts, they're super territorial. They oh, yeah. flap their tails and spray shit as a mechanism to draw mates. Their skin is covered in oil. And they're both land. They go on the land. So it's not like... Look at you. God, you know everything now, Peter. Dude, You're like, like basically a wildlife encyclopedia now. I'm a fucking did you, honorary broologist. Did you know this, though? In Colombia, where hippos are not native to because they're native to sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. there are now 80 hippos roaming around in uh, the Rio Magdalena. And guess how they got there? I know Patrick already knows Teddy this, Roosevelt but, flew them in. Nope. Try someone who's who's far more evil and also awesome than Teddy Roosevelt that's from Colombia. Oh, yeah, yeah. The guy who had the hippos. Uh, the drug lord. Pablo Escobar. Yeah, Pablo, oh. Pablo Escobar. Oh, God. Pablo Escobar brought in hippos into his estate because he thought they were cool. And then when he was gunned down in Medellin or wherever the hell it was, somebody went and let them out. And now there's 80 of them roaming around the rivers of Colombia and they've tried to eradicate them, but they haven't been successful. And the hippos have killed a bunch of people. And oh, like, God. yeah, on this river, there's 80 hippos in Colombia. Pablo lives on through the hippos, just just That's terrorizing right. the people. No offense, Pablo. I mean, or anybody who's associated with them. I have nothing but good things to say about that entire crew. Well, the thing is, so hippos, the stats say it depends on your source, but they kill anywhere from 500 to 3,000 people year, uh, each year. It just seems a little dangerous. Like... You're like partying for Mardi Gras and all of a sudden there's a hippo and then you're like, 
Is this part of the parade? What do I do? Should I pet it? Do I go near it? <laughs> He's on Bourbon Street. Yeah. Chicks are, chicks are throwing beads at him. Oh, God. So, what would a hippo do if you were flashing your tits and throwing beads at it? What, what do you think it, it would, would destroy you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so it got voted down in Congress, and it sounds like, Forrest, do you think that was the right move? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it, it's funny. We've made this mistake time and time and time again where we bring in an invasive species to eradicate another invasive species, and what does that lead to? It, and it leads to having two terrible invasive species that are creating more collapse. Um, well, and, and it's just plants. I feel like there's a better way than to introduce a wildly erratic killer animal. Well, I mean... From a layman's perspective, certainly could be the case, but invasive plants are hugely problematic. Um, you know, they, they create all kinds of, uh, ecological nightmares. But anytime you try and fight an invasive species by bringing in another invasive species, you do not have success. And I mean, perfect examples of that are cane toads in Australia, mongoose in the Hawaiian Islands, and the list goes on and on and on. All these places where animals were brought in to combat another animal. And then they just go rampant. And the reason being they have no natural predators, right? Mm -hmm. So if you brought in hippos to the, the, the bayou, where are the lions and the Nile crocodiles and all the things that eat hippos? There aren't any. So it, it, it's entirely up to people to keep their numbers in check, which, which we could do, you know, most likely. But it, if we don't manage that at all, in no time flat, there could be millions of hippos in Louisiana that, you know, and then it's, and then it's Armageddon. Yeah. It's hippos taking (laughs) over the world. That's, that's, that's the upshot of Teddy Roosevelt's plan. Nice. Yeah. So the one, one guy did an analysis and said, because part of the, as part of the bill that they proposed, uh, there was no plan for management of the hippo population. Great. Uh, so they're saying that they would, we would now have hippos, tens of thousands of hippos living in Louisiana, Georgia, Florida, and Mississippi. Uh, just running rampant. I I totally believe it, and they're they are very yeah they're super destructive. It would be it would be a nightmare. Hilarious. I could totally see why Teddy Roosevelt would want to do it. Keep in mind he was a huge hunter, right? The whole reason yeah. he created the national park system was so that there was more game to hunt. And yeah. you know if you're Teddy Roosevelt sitting sitting around in 1910 going hmm what's a fun thing to shoot in Louisiana? Let's bring in some swamp bacon. I get it. Um, but as far as an ecological move, it's it's a terrible one. Ah, sorry. Modelo number two, tall boy for Retap. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> In honor of uh, next week's Shark Week, Land of the Lost Shark, starring Forrest, there was some tiger, some some tiger shark news this week. Yeah, this is good. It's interesting. It's it's not really news as far as like breaking headlines. But I thought I thought it was interesting. And what it is, is, you know, tiger sharks and some other species can actually puke their entire guts out in an effort to regurgitate inedible biomass Hmm. that gets ingested as a byproduct of eating large meals. So in other words, you know, if I'm. Let's see, if I'm a tiger shark and there is a seal sitting on a on a tire and I come up and chomp the seal and the car tire all at once. And I start to digest that and I go, wait a minute, I can't process this rubber car tire. They will puke out not just the contents of what they've eaten, but they will actually puke their guts out of their mouth as well mm. as a means by which to um, eject that inedible thing. And when it works, it helps them stay healthy, um, but it does stress them out, right? As you can imagine, getting an organ externally in your body is, is huge physical stress and it can cause them to spasm. It can cause them to puke out their entire stomachs through their mouths which will lead to their death. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a mystery of evolution. It's like, why did they evolve the ability to do this? We could never throw up our stomachs, right? Not true. But why did I they... do it every time I eat Taco Bell. <laughs> Gross. But the question is, why did they evolve the ability to do this when it hinders them um, oftentimes more than it helps them versus just puking out the contents of what they've eaten? So I don't hmm. know. I thought it was cool. That is, that is super weird. Like as an evolved trait, something that does not, help it survive that's that's really bizarre maybe it's like a way of maybe it's like a way of committing suicide right like it gets to a point where the pain is so extreme that they're trying to digest this tire that they're like well i could either slowly wither away and die or puke guts out die and it's all over yeah that's an interesting thought that is interesting. i don't know i don't know what you know and sometimes i think sometimes evolutionary biologists overlook the fact that 
not everything evolves for a reason of perfection, right? Like this could be a side effect of something mm. that, that, you know, so the animals evolved these stomachs to be able to digest X, Y, and Z. And this is a side effect. This is the downside of having that that evolutionary advantage. It's like it's like the peacock. I always go back to the peacock when talking about evolution, right? <laughs> it evolved to have this beautiful, incredible tail so that females will mate with it. But at the same time, it weighs it down. It makes it slower and more useless at flight so that more predators can catch it. Like there's a negative side effect as well as a positive one. And that could be what we're seeing here. Nature just hasn't figured it out yet. Well, nature figured it out. Humans haven't figured out why they do it yet. Exactly. Yeah. There's, it's a scale, right? Everything, like if you're taking energy away from one thing, you're giving it to something else. And so the scales tip no matter how, how it's cut, how, how it's weighed. Is there anything else that, that is similar to this that you've heard of in, in nature, uh, forest? With regards to, you know, ways. Essentially a suicide because, because of, uh, whatever reason. You get, it gets wounded or it, it eats. Oh, some... there's tons, man. There's tons. I think what's bizarre about this is that sharks are, typically at the top of the food chain but prey mm, species mm. like you, you guys know this i have rabbits right you've seen you've seen my giant rabbits yeah they will they are such they are such instinctually prey species that if they are shocked too much they will keel over and die the last big thunderstorm we had here in santa barbara two of our rabbits just died of fright really and that's just like <laughs> yeah and and that's not abuse it's not Jesus. like we were, weren't taking care of them they just heard a loud noise and we're like dead i'm you done know, that's wow. the end yeah i'm done that's scary done and I mean, that just goes to show what prey species they are, right? So if you're a wolf hunting a rabbit and you're able to startle it to the point of collapse, then you get the meal and it like helps the ecosystem out entirely because the mm. wolf has to expend less energy, the rabbit gets eaten, the rabbit's lower down the food chain, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of examples of animals having these weird kind of niche behaviors, if you will, that uh, <laughs> lead to their demise, I guess. Well, dude, one of the it's coolest wild. ones, and it's, I guess it's also probably more of an example of altruism, but uh, vervet monkeys, if they see a predator, one of the monkeys will actually commit suicide by making a bunch of noise, mm -hmm. basically telling the predator it's there, and then it doesn't run, and it'll let so the predator the come and away. kill it while the others get away. So Jesus. it will effectively commit suicide so that the rest of its, its troop can escape. That's pretty crazy. And, and like where, you know, I think this comes back to like that, uh, that thing that I like to talk about sometimes about uh, anthropomorphizing animals. Like, is that animal doing that out of love for its troop? Is there emotional attachment? Is that evolution kicking in? Is that instinct? Like, and we don't know the answer to this, right? Like, I, I had two vervet monkeys growing up. I, Chippy was the one that survived. And, and Patrick, you know the stories. He used to hang out in my, butt, in my mosquito net above my bed and i i know for a fact that they feel uh that they're emotional animals and they feel attachment and they feel anger and everything else but is that monkey that's committing suicide you know is it is it like is it like tom cruise in the last samurai where he's standing <laughs> out there in front of everybody like this is my time this is my thing i'm doing this you know or is it just is it just instinct kicking in <laughs> where it doesn't even realize that it's doing that. And it's just, it, I don't know. And I don't think anybody knows. It's really fascinating. I mean, yeah. Do you think Chippy was trying to commit suicide when he uh, attacked your dad while he was eating breakfast? <laughs> he would have thought it. Yeah, I, I, he never did it again. So I don't think so. <laughs> Wait, have, you haven't told the story of Chippy on the podcast. I, I think you got to tell it. Yeah. It's I, hilarious, dude. <laughs> so okay so i used to so i grew up on a farm in zimbabwe and the na we have a lot of native species there we had serval cats uh we had daiko we and then we had vervet monkeys and none of these animals did we go out and catch in the wild but as we ran a farm from time to time we used to rescue things and uh one time i was down at the stables and uh there was an abandoned vervet monkey and his name was chippy and well, we named him Chippy, but there was an abandoned. <laughs> I like that his name was already uh, Chippy. He had been named Chippy. That's by right. His... <laughs> yeah. um, and it was very weird because going back to what we were talking about a minute ago, you know, they're they're fantastic parents. They're great mothers, like primates and monkeys in general. They care about their young. So why Chippy was totally abandoned? And his troop was up in the tree, and and he was sitting down there, shivering, eyes still closed on the ground, and it was very very odd. Well, we came to find out several years later that Chippy had a heart murmur and his mother knew that. So she'd abandoned him, you know, young. But when we scooped him up and I bottle fed him every single night, et cetera, he lived and he lived for several years before his heart murmur caught up with him. And uh, Chippy was 
literally my best friend. And I'm gonna, Peter, I'm gonna send you a picture of Chippy and me as a kid that you can post on the Wild Times social media so people can see what Chippy looked like. Hell yeah. Will people be able to best. tell who's who? They will Doubtful. not. They will not. I, I had buck teeth. I had a bad monkey haircut. I <laughs> probably had a tail. Uh, <laughs> you couldn't have looked worse than Pat did when he was a kid. He looked like, <laughs> Good point. like a legit that's, monk. That's monkey. why I poke fun. I'm poking fun of myself. So the story that Patrick's referring to is Chippy used to sleep. Um, so I had a mos- mosquito net over my bed in Zimbabwe. Lots of mosquitoes there, lots of malaria. And Chippy would curl up in the top of the mosquito net like a bunk bed every night. And he'd sleep above me and, and I'd sleep in the bed. And when I'd wake up in the morning, he'd hop off the bunk bed onto my shoulders and you know mess with my hair and go running out into the trees or go running out into the yard, etc. Except one day, Chippy decided it would be very, very funny if he were to cause some trouble. And so I woke up and I got dressed for school and uh, and Chippy did what he'd been doing for about four days. And what he did was he, he hopped down on my shoulders and disappeared for a little bit. And I sat down at breakfast with my dad, who was very strict and very proper. And uh, we were having oatmeal. And Chippy came bolting down, <laughs> jumped on my shoulders. Who, and I was at one head of the table. My dad was at the other. Jumped off my shoulders onto the table, ran across the table, shoved his hands into my dad's <laughs> oatmeal slash part <laughs> jumped up onto my dad in his armani suit my dad was a businessman and started pu- pushing the oatmeal around in my dad's hair and literally screeching with laughter and my dad again like very stern african man was like that's the end of this bloody monkey and he stood up and he went and got a shotgun and i was like screaming and crying i was like no dad no dad don't do it don't do it and, and chippy hopped into the trees i was like run chippy run and, and my dad loads a shotgun and starts firing and thank oh god it was god. only a, it was a it was a side by side with two shots and my dad took two shots and chippy thought it was a game he took the first shot and missed Chippy entirely, and he jumped into another tree, and then my dad reloaded, shot again, and he jumped back into the first tree. My dad threw the gun on the ground and stormed out, and fortunately, he didn't hit Chippy. Do you think, <laughs> now, do you think that your dad intentionally missed the monkey just to, like, put the fear of God into both the monkey and your yours hearts? To this day, I don't know, but I would say probably. He was a pretty <laughs> damn good shot, and I think he was just trying to scare the shit out of both of us, and it worked. I made sure Chippy was locked up until my dad left the house every single day <laughs> from that morning. On. Wait, it's funny uh, because it's funny because, like, when Patrick was like, yeah, tell the story about the monkey who would hang out, and then you had mentioned that it would, like, hang out on top of your mosquito net or whatever. I'm picturing you, like, in, in a small hut like with with like a a wood carved table having having porridge in the morning with your dad who says you know you guys are just like whatever like third world country living and then your dad's got a business suit on an Armani suit <laughs> you're like you're slowly letting these details in the mu- he pulls out a shotgun <laughs> Yeah, no, I didn't live in a mud hut, Peter. I, I don't know. Nice I, I don't know. You <laughs> still you still think that zebras come from out of space, so I'm not quite clear where you came from. Well, no, out out of space. Isn't out that what I said? Space. What did I say? Right. God damn it. I biffed my own joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's time for my new favorite segment, the Bizarre Animal of the Week. So the Bizarre Animal this week, for everybody listening, let me, let me pose some questions to you. Yes. It's from Japan. It's ubiquitous there in Japanese folklore. Um, folklore, excuse me. It's, it's a very weird creature. For any of our video game nerds, it was featured in the 1990 Nintendo game Super Mario Bros. 3, which, of course, originated in Japan. Wait. And what else? Is it? What? Is it, they have Yoshis in Japan? <laughs> You're close. <laughs> Little dinosaurs. Your Mario Kart. Wait, little mushrooms so that walk around? <laughs> this Japanese animal is an invasive species in Sweden, which is bizarre. Don't know how they that's, got there. That's I real probably weird. That. Probably Pablo Escobar yeah. fucking. Very weird. Yeah. And to, to, paint, to finally paint the picture for you, imagine an animal that's a raccoon. But wait, it's also a dog. What? And if you look at the two, there's no way to tell which one it is. It might be a raccoon. It might be a dog. It gets the nickname the raccoon dog. This week's bizarre animal of the week is the tanuki. The tanuki. Peter, you were you were kind of onto something there because Super Mario Brothers three, the 1990 Nintendo game, mm-hmm. did feature a tanuki. 
uh, where Mario could put on a tanuki suit and transform into a oh, the tanuki like animal. suit. That's right. The tanuki yeah. suit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's the everybody called that the raccoon suit. Or is there a different suit that was different from the raccoon suit? It was the t- it was the tanuki suit. There wasn't a raccoon suit. N- that was the suit of Are the you? Japanese native animal. That's bananas. The, uh, the tanuki. You Wait, just so- blew so many people's minds because every single Boom. person person thought and still thought to this day that that was a raccoon suit. Well, neither there, tanuki sir. nor raccoons can fly, which Mario could when he put the suit on. <laughs> uh, but he oh, needed so- a good, long-running start, man. So did... Did a dog mate with a raccoon for us? Is that what happened here? That's a good question. And that is exactly what it looks like from an outside perspective. But it's not. It's actually just, it is a canine, meaning it's it's a dog, but it's evolved these raccoon-like features and, and some behaviors. And what I mean by some behaviors is it's actually the only canine in the world that hibernates. Really? So like when mm-hmm. you say hibernate, like hibernates for several between, days weeks yeah. months at a time no between november and april every year the animals take a long nap <laughs> um you know it. but they don't go they don't sleep too deeply they go okay. they go into hibernation um and they have to store enough fat pre-hibernation uh you know they wake up and forage for food etc real quick so the the big bra- the uh the brown bat hibernates the longest of any animal out of 365 days a year just just take a guess how many days it can hibernate up to? Oh, wow. 364.7. That's a stupid you're, guess. You're a fuck. I'm going to say 200 days a year. 344. Uh, it was way oh closer, God. but I went over. So you do win. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Price is Right rules always. <laughs> always. You're, I mean, that's amazing. Imagine sleeping for all year. <laughs> now, do these well, animals, does, does it also sleep like regularly, eight hours a night or whatever, a few hours a night in addition to doing well, the hibernation? It, it, or is it just... It's a bat, so it sleeps during the day still, <laughs> during the 21 days a year that it's not hibernating. <laughs> what a fucking piece of shit animal. What is it even doing? <laughs> do we need them? Is that what you're asking? Do we need them? Uh, something's we get probably rid of them? eating them, is that what I would like imagine. Yeah, they, they're eating in soup. All right, so that is our bizarre animal of the week. Um, the t- Patrick, t- you yeah. suggested a pretty funny battle royale you want to you want to tell us about it yeah ladies and gentlemen and listeners and wild bunch and wild boys it's time for the battle royale <laughs> battle royale oh god <laughs> all right this is gonna be a good one hell yeah be a good one Let's i haven't right. won according to the wild bunch <laughs> i haven't won one in a while nah so it's always I'm either gonna... forest or me Oh, yeah, I'm gonna it try. has been a minute it has been a minute since patrick has won one people just don't get mine you know what i mean <laughs> Uh, all right, so here it is. <laughs> it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a real battle royale. We're going to build a team of Ooh. three, three okay. each. Okay. okay. We're each going to draft a team, snake draft. Three okay. mm. members of the team, all nine of them are going to come together and fight till death. Smart. Oh, Whoever sweet. has the last thing standing wins. This better be good. Thing, thing standing makes me intrigued. All right, so <laughs> instead of animals... What we're going to draft is cartoon characters. Nice. You know, from, from our I childhood, from present yeah. day. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's okay if they use brute force and strength. It's okay if they use their wits. Great. I love <laughs> their it. Their wits. I love it. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, you want me to go first? I'll go first here. Sure. You go first, first in a while. That's why I never win because I never go first. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So Makes what I'm sense. not going to do is I'm not going to fall into the trap of just going for the biggest the biggest one, right? Sure. I'm going to start with a cartoon character animal. It's the same They're size always, as you. Meager, it's small. The same, same size as me. It is meager and small. Mm-hmm. But yet, in hundreds, if not thousands of episodes, <laughs> it outwitted and beat an animal much bigger than him. I know who it is. I, I know, know who it is, is too. Who, who yeah. do you think it is? It's the Roadrunner. No, no. Incorrect. Jerry. Jerry from Tom Jer- and Jerry. Oh, you nailed smart. it. <laughs> it is the mouse, Jerry from Tom and Jerry, oh, who just thousands of times managed to destroy a yeah. ferocious cat predator mm-hmm. hundreds of times his, his body mass. True. Right. I'm taking Jerry as the first overall pick. Okay. Wow. 
All right, who's who's up second? I, I mean, it's not a bad pick. It's ridiculous because one Jerry versus any animals that we're going to pick. Versus it, who, Peter? You're clearly up second. Versus okay. Yeah, you're, you're right. up next. Yeah. Now, do, yeah. am I picking one or two? I still don't know this fucking You, get, you take one. Okay. People on the ends take two. F off. Jesus. Um, fuck you. So, okay, so my pick is going to just fucking destroy your tiny meager mouse. I mean, you picked a mouse that is tiny and uh, just Meager, equivalent in equivalent in stature <laughs> as you uh, quick witted, perhaps. But my, you you just mentioned Forrest the uh, Road Runner. However, I will pick his nemesis, the Coyote, and I'm going to tell you why. Because a he cannot die. He's been smashed by anvils. True. He has been run over by cars. He runs trucks. He's fallen off cliffs and he always bounces back. He cannot die. And apparently he has access to a very large arsenal of, of weapons and whatnot. I don't know where he's getting all of these anvils and trucks, but he will, he will have an arsenal. <laughs> can't die. Also, he's, he's, he's very smart. The, the only one that could potentially fucking beat him is the Roadrunner. He is a buffoon. He has never accomplished anything. He's, I've I've killed a roadrunner with my shoe. Never accomplished anything. I, that's that's never happened. But still, <laughs> uh. <laughs> wait. He's not a road. Oh, you're saying that he can't kill her. They're very fast. You've never killed a roadrunner with your shoe. I know. I have you either, didn't draft the, the roadrunner. You drafted the coyote. I did. Yeah. Well, he was saying though that that he that Forrest has killed the roadrunner with his shoe, and my coyote hasn't in decades of trying to kill the Roadrunner, been able to get him, even with an arsenal full of anvils and trucks. Okay. All right. That's a pick. Okay. Uh, that's, I'm, right. I can't say I'm blown away by either of your first choices, but I'll... Uh... Maybe just blown? Sorry. <laughs> All right. So I get two. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to split up my team, one with wits, one with size, <laughs> and one with speed. That's so three, got, not two. Okay. Correct. I mm-hmm. get three picks, doofus. But two um, to start. Two to start. Yes, I know. So my first two picks, um, I'm going to lead with an obvious choice because I think if I don't pick him, someone else will. This is speed. This is chaos. It's basically the the cartoon equivalent of the Hulk from 20 years ago, Taz, the Tasmanian Tiger. I think you meant well, you think Tasmanian, you meant Tasmanian, Tasmanian Devil. Devil. The Devil. Sorry, well, first Devil. of all, I've, you, I've always got Tasmanian now, Tigers on the brain. Listen, <laughs> Taz, the Tasmanian he's, Devil. He's off. You can't select him since you fucked up, <laughs> fucked up nope, what he even nope, is. I've got him. <laughs> you have no control over this thing. What is he going to do? You're just going to throw him in there and he's going to tornado he's a around? He's Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think? You've seen what happens when people try and fight him. They just get caught in his little vortex. Nah, even Jerry um, could take out Taz with quick wow. wit. Well, you know who Jerry couldn't take out? Uh, the same, a, a superior cat and my second pick. <laughs> who's there all for wits, not to mention just great disposition in general, Puss in Boots. <laughs> Puss Smart. in Boots. Good pick. Yeah. Good pick. Yep. I thought you were going to pick Garfield when you said dis- g- great disposition. Just no yeah, I did too. Just terrible. <laughs> Puss, Puss in Boots in has boots. a little sword, right? Doesn't he have a sword with him? He's got, he's got a little a little scaber. Is that what you say? Scaber? Scaber? It's that little pointy no, sword. That, he has a small a- sword. Parasaber in English is your preferred language. And a nice language. hat. A and he is an expert thief. He's able okay. to steal things from anyone. And he's adorable. He can do the big eyes and just stop you dead in your tracks. How are you going to get Taz really and him cute. to work together as a team to take... I mean, this is a team that we're trying to create here. It's understood that these animals will work together. No. Uh-uh. Yes. It is. You've, essentially, you've essentially picked... A, a wild fucking uncontrollable animal to be on your team. It's going to kill your, it's going to kill Puss in Boots. The t- Tasmanian devil is. You have no control over this animal. It's a bad pick. You Patrick, move on, Peter. You're up. No, it's you. You still don't know how this works. We've I have no idea. Has no clue. I have no, no, no idea. idea. All right. So I'm, I'm, I'm second. Do I pick one or two? Two? One. one. Oh okay. my God. It's brutal. He's it was a hammered. joke. You fucking idiots. It was a joke. <laughs> That's how I always get away with my stupidity. Um, So my second pick, he will be teamed up with Marvin the Martian, who has a gun. Very smart. It's not an animal. animal. Uh, It's a fuck you. You said you said thing. You said thing. He said animal. 
So How do you know fucking? Months. What are you talking denied. about? Denied? A Martian? Denied. No, nope. this is bullshit. Martian's not an animal, dude. And okay, I did fine. say animal very clearly. Nah, yeah, you didn't. Denied. And Try if again. you did, I will edit that out and make it sound like you didn't. Stupid. Um, all right, fine. I'll pick. I'll pick a different animal. God damn it! So I'm gonna pick just an amazing creature. Let me think. <laughs> God damn it! All right, I'm going with. I'm going with Ren from Ren and Stimpy because he is violent and he's smart. What is Ren? Is I don't know, but he'll take. I think it's a Chihuahua. He's he'll a take Chihuahua, a shit on your head and laugh and laugh. I mean, look, Chihuahuas are violent, so it, you they know are. he's going to go on the it's attack just, immediately. Yeah, it's just not. It's not a Chihuahua. It's Ren. He's an intelligent, smart Chihuahua. He's the brains of the duo. Okay, that's a good pick. So you've wasted your picks. You've <laughs> well, you guys. Committed. Marvin the Martian is absolutely a, an allowable pick. You guys vetoed it. Wrong. I think it's bullshit. Shh. Wrong. Stop it. All right. So to, <laughs> you said to add, to add to Jerry. I'm going with wits here for my last two picks because Mm -hmm. I'm going to have the smartest team so that leading up to the battle, they can build weapons and devise a strategy because it's not the, the, you know, there's a reason the U S army isn't just a bunch of jacked bodybuilders. True. You know, you need brains. So first I'm going to go with bugs bunny. Okay. Ooh. He's hilarious. Uh, he's, he's very witty. He's always scheming. And quite frankly, you know, thousands of episodes in, he's never been shot. He's That's never true. been shot. That's true. Uh, he's so, evasive as fuck. Yeah, okay. so him and Jerry, I think, I've sort of already probably got what should have been the first two picks. Um, <laughs> and then with my Nonsense. third and final pick, I'm going to go with Chip from Chip and Dale, the Rescue Rangers. Wow. So you have uh, two, two tiny rodents. <laughs> On your team, what yeah. are you thinking? Okay. So let me let me just let me just lay this out. Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers was a great show. Uh, nothing best. to do with building a, a team that is going to beat the yeah. other two teams. But here's the thing: Chip could fly an airplane, and he wears a Hawaiian <laughs> shirt. Like who? who what Hawaiian animal shirt. is going to? Who's going to kill an adorable chipmunk who's wearing a Hawaiian <laughs> shirt? Nobody. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right. Well, Peter, you're up for your last pick, and no, you can't take an alien or any other type of humanoid. Yeah, or or a hammer or a rock or anything else stupid that you're thinking currently. Or a what monster. About, what? Yeah. You know your next pick that was from Monsters, Inc.? Take that out of the equation. Listen to me. This is... I, I fucking disagree entirely with the way that the game was described and the rules were laid out. This is supposed to be fun for the listeners, not painful, because yeah. this is painful <laughs> to listen to. What are you talking about? I, I'm just, I'm just, just, just lay your pick on us, you doofus. Oh fuck you! I hate you both. <laughs> All right, so I am going to pick a very clever, very clever animal, man's best friend. He is an icon, an iconic cartoon character so not only will your stupid team animals that are fucking morons be starstruck when they see him he's he's uncovered he's solved many mysteries he's uncovered many fucking crimes and it is scooby-doo the dog from the hit tv series and movie scooby-doo he will be able to clearly fucking sniff out some kind of goddamn winning strategy along with my other two. Why are you shaking your head? I, you guys really nonsense. Fucking, You're just babbling Marvin nonsense. Marvin the Martian is, I'm still, <laughs> I just can't get over it. He has a gun. You said thing. Scooby-Doo I, I, doesn't I'm have a gun. One. No, okay. Marvin the Martian does my, though, but you, you overruled him. You stole my Hawaiian shirt idea. All right, Forrest, what's your third and final <laughs> pick to add to uh-huh. me? Tasmanian Devil, and I don't even remember the other thing you picked. Puss in Boots, the adorable Puss in Boots. Well, given that nobody has picked even a decent-sized animal yet in this bizarre lineup, I am going to shift focus and add Baloo, the friendly bear from the Jungle Book, to uh, to my team, so that I've got one badass warrior athlete on my squad mixed in with Taz and Puss in Boots. And I think, you know, you, you got Baloo for strength, um, and cuddliness you got yeah. puss in boots for cunningness 
and you got Taz for just general destruction, you've got to win the team. <laughs> now, my problem with Baloo is that I believe he was a sloth bear. Uh, <laughs> he was. <laughs> That's correct. Um, you also described him as friendly, and in, I just Google imaged him, and in every photo, he's smiling and dancing. <laughs> That's true. I was going to go with Shere Khan, the evil tiger, but Shere Khan always loses, and Baloo and Mowgli always won. So I'm going with I'm going with Baloo, and I'd love to sit on the tummy of a bear and sing a nice song as I drift down a creek. That does sound fun. That does yeah, sound great. really fun. All right, so we all sort of went. So I have a chipmunk, a mouse. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what Peter did. I, Wait, I, I, you have a coyote. Uh, your, a yours fucking- is a disaster. A coyote, a very witty, clever coyote. I wish I could have picked Marvin the Martian, but I was forced to pick fucking Scooby-Doo. And then I forget what my other one even was because it was the one that replaced Marvin. I think oh, people God. are sick of you cheating, to be honest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think that you guys have no fucking understanding of our listener base whatsoever because I'm the only one that ever speaks with them. <laughs> and I also... Well, I, if I could... Ahead, uh, if I had the option to pick a squad, it would be the Woodland Critter Christmas from <laughs> South Park. The the blood sex orgy critters from South oh, Park God. that rape everything. But that wasn't that wasn't the squad was not an option. And I think individually the Woodland Critters are pretty useless. <laughs> well, if you've hated every second of this because of Peter, uh, go ahead and let us know no on fun. iTunes. Comment on the podcast. Uh, we're doing a giveaway this week. We've randomly picked one of our reviews. What are they going to win this week, Forrest? What, what, what's the prize? What's the prize? I have a delightful, shiny, brand new pair of Shark Week brand sunglasses sent Ooh. to me by Discovery Channel. They are only for people on Discovery Channel, so they're an exclusive item Ooh. that I am willing to give away to Patrick. This week, the winner is Mr. Eklund. Mr. What does Eklund- Mr. Eklund have to say? Well, this is, I'm quoting him, so don't get mad at me for this first part. What's up, bromosexuals? Forrest's barbecue, hands down, is where you'd want to go. I've seen Mm. what he can do with that Traeger grill, and it leaves the mouth salivating. Patrick's (laughs) mead doesn't make up for his Hawaiian trash pig. Based on his description (laughs) of what they'll eat, I'm assuming it's the meat they use at Taco Bell. Speaking (laughs) of Taco Bell, I'm convinced after this many episodes, it's the only thing Ratep would truly be able to forage for. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I hope I haven't injected too much product placement to avoid the read aloud. Keep doing what you're doing. So, wow. Mr. Eklund, if you, uh, you know, if you follow us on social media, and everyone should, at the Wild Times Podcast, hit us up. No, it's and, uh, at Wild Times Pod, dum dum. At Wild Times Pod. God thank damn you. it. You're the worst. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, That's actually pretty cool. I'm actually kind of jealous. I want those sunglasses because you know they're the polarized ones, right? They're for finding sharks. Exactly Mm. right. Exactly right. So, Mr. Eklund, hit us up. Everybody else, leave us a review. Leave us a five-star review on iTunes and a comment. We might read yours out loud. We might give you a random gift like we did tonight. We Mm -hmm. might do threaten you with another competition. Doesn't really matter. Let us know who won the Battle Royale. Super important. Um, we it's all know. super important. Yeah, it's big <laughs> times. Um, you know, you have nothing better going on in 2020, let's be honest. And uh, yeah, good night. We love you. Hey, good night. Wild Find bunch. Patrick DeLuca on IMDb and leave him a one-star Shh. review. Good night. Shh. You fucking moron. I don't know what you said at the end. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.